Hi, this is Chiezan, the prior at Sokokoji Buddhist Monastery. If you value these talks and would like them to continue, please visit our donate page at www.sokokoji.org. Thank you. As always, I really appreciate all of you joining us for Basic Buddhist Teachings. I find that it can be a little bit of a hard time slot. We're at the end of the week, but there's still some inspiration here to look at the Dharma. And this evening, I want to talk about a topic that, um, that I, I find a lot of inspiration in, and a lot of curiosity, and a lot of energy in. I don't know if it will translate to anybody else's energy, but that is the Bodhisattva path. I think that is something that we could probably talk about indefinitely because it is at the core of, of our practice. But I wanted to start out a little bit before the Bodhisattva path. It's a traditional structure in Buddhism. Sokazan's talked about this a bit, and it's called ground, path, and fruition. And I wanted to talk a little bit about starting with uh, the initial ground of Buddhism. And not just in a traditional sense of the earliest teachings of the Buddha in the form of the Nikayas and the Vinaya, the, the monastic code, the monastic rules that were set forth. But I think for a lot of us, the initial ground for Buddhism probably was not uh, the Bodhisattva path. It's a tremendous undertaking, the vow to be with all things. But that initial ground was, for most of us, suffering in its rawest sense. That what brought us to the path of meditation, and perhaps further into the path of Buddhism, was the intense discomfort, the disease that we experienced, and we probably tried for years or decades to alleviate unsuccessfully. And then we stumble into a path that to me gives us another opportunity, which is instead of alleviating the suffering, initially can you see what the suffering is? So to use a term to describe this, I'm going to use the term Shravakayana. <clears throat> The Shravakayana, the Shravakas, were the uh, initial disciples of the Buddha, heard the first teachings of the Buddha, and I'm using this in place of the term Hinayana. Hinayana was a term created by the Mahayanist, and it means lesser vehicle, um, but it really just refers to the earliest practitioners of the Dharma. So our connection to the Dharma initially is probably in this more early and provisional sense because our suffering is so overwhelming that we can't even really think about the rest of the world. And when we do think about the rest of the world, it's more out of trying to ignore our own suffering. And so it's further confusing samsara or the world because we don't really see where we're functioning from. Trungpa Rinpoche talked about seated meditation in this way, that the seated meditation really is the, the Hinayana or the provisional or the Shravakayana approach because we're working on ourselves. We're working on trying to see more clearly the nature of the suffering, the nature of the identity which believes it is suffering, and the nature of the other which we often blame for the suffering. But it's in this suffering that our first seeds of the Bodhisattva path uh, become apparent. We get our first glimpses of the Bodhisattva path because as we look at the suffering, which initially probably shows up in the forms of stories of why I'm suffering, the cause of suffering, fighting with the suffering, we start to recognize something uh, to me that's a little more raw. It's a little less conceptual and it feels incredibly intimate. And it's when we begin to see this raw quality of suffering that the Bodhisattva path can be, begin to arise because we see that it is not unique. It's not this special situation that we have isolated from others. And so at this point, it's like uh, metaphorically speaking, we can lift our gaze. We lift our gaze and we see the world. 
And what we recognize is not dissimilar to what we saw as we were training our minds to look at our own suffering. And this is to me a very important aspect of the Bodhisattva path is this idea of raising one's gaze and looking up. And Sokazan's even talked about this in the Zendo here. For those of you that have been or, or looking into the Zendo, everyone faces the wall except for the Doan. And Sokazan at one point years ago had mentioned something along those lines to me is that the Doan, in a sense, is practicing a Bodhisattva practice in that their gaze is raised, they're looking out into the space, and they're holding that form for the benefit of every, everyone that comes and goes from the Zendo. It also resonates with another practice Sokazan gives for um, Dokusan for interviews or for relating to partners where you would spend a few moments looking into somebody's eyes. And to me, when we do that, there's something we're recognizing that is less conceptual especially if we do that for a little bit of time where we actually take time to notice the first impulses or feelings of discomfort or self-consciousness or anger and as we continue to sit and we cycle through all of these emotions we begin to see a human being we begin to see what i feel we recognize when we sit down and practice meditation so a glimpse of the bodhisattva path and in preparing for this talk i have been looking at uh the works of chogyam trangpa rinpoche some of you know he has a three volume collection the first one is the individual path of liberation which talks about the earliest provisional teachings of the buddha the second volume deals with the mahayana and the third with the vajrayana and i i did want to share a few things that he said because i was not only interested in looking at the bodhisattva path and i'm very interested in this idea of um, bodhicitta or that that energy to serve others that inspiration to function for the benefit of others but the idea of the paramitas continuously comes up for me not as something i understand but something that is pretty aspirational for me and i think that they're concrete in the sense of generosity discipline, meditation, they're not overly complicated and yet they're incredibly subtle and complicated. So this first um, very brief excerpt from Trungpa Rinpoche, he says, Paramita practice is based on human decency and how to be in the world and help others who are suffering. What resonates with me is, is the simplicity, the directness of it. The practice of the paramitas is about recognizing human decency. And that's not something that is transactional, nor is it particularly earned. It is recognizing the basic situation of suffering, the first noble truth, recognizing the first noble truth universally. When you recognize the first noble truth of suffering universally, there's nobody outside of your vow. There's no longer the ability to discriminate who to help and who not to help. So it, it takes some of the difficulty out of it. It makes it a little bit simpler. You don't have to decide who's worthy of helping. You recognize suffering. You also recognize that you are looking at it eye to eye. You're not looking at it from above down. And so the best thing we can do initially is not much. Uh, so Kazan says, don't do anything unless you have to. And the Bodhisattva should proceed to me in that sense, very slowly, very carefully, very organically, that we're not talking about paramitas that are prescribed that there's a, a checklist or that there's an agenda or a handbook, although there's tons of handbooks. <laughs> the Buddhism's full of the handbooks of bodhicitta. But it's not the activity that's being prescribed, it's the situation, it's recognizing the situation. 
The other one I wanted to share was another very simple one. Instead of building yourself up, you should continue with your pursuit of helping others. Instead of being selfish, you should empty yourself. The basic definition of ego is holding on to one's existence. And the way I understand this and from working with Sokazan is we might actually work with that backwards. We might have to start with that last line. The basic definition of ego is holding on to one's existence. If that's unclear, if we're not clear about the grasping at a self and the grasping at others, every gesture is going to be filtered through that, that layer of confusion, which is belief in a self and a belief in others. So the line, instead of being selfish, you should empty yourself, uh, that may not work initially. It's not something you can just take content and remove it. We're not looking to be absent of content, but we can start at that idea of what is it that's being held on to? This was a, I recorded, I recorded one line from Sokazan this week in, on my phone, and it was, I have to paraphrase it, but it was, who is it that gets offended? That's the starting point for me right now. And everything else is being filtered through that misunderstanding. So we have to start with the misunderstanding. Uh, I think that's even one of the slogans, start with the greatest defilement, is that? So from Atisha's slogan, start with the greatest defilement. And that's, um, to me, a pretty profound statement. We actually get to start with whatever is showing up as confusion. We don't have to work past that. We don't have to look for the more subtle forms. So for me, look at who is still being offended. The clarity may be very precise. It may be very logical. It may be very reasonable. But as long as it's attached, attached to an identity, it can only serve samsara. That no matter how precise our worldview is and how backed up our worldview is, as long as it's attached to an identity, suffering is the inevitable result of that. Or you could say it is suffering. And then Trungpa Rinpoche, the last thing, in, in talking about the first paramita of generosity, he said it's not about what you have or lack. So that's interesting that our generosity is not the items we have and can give or the items that we're lacking and therefore we cannot give, but our willingness to part with what we hold as precious and what we want to hold on to. So generosity is not simply a transaction of, of items. It's not something that we have to first acquire in order to be generous, but it's a willingness to share whatever it is that we do have in the form of our confusion and our clarity with others. So Dana Paramita is the first Paramita on the Bodhisattva path. And to me, um, in some sense, is the essence of the Bodhisattva path. The, the willingness to give everything, to look at uh, the miserliness, or what Trungpa Rinpoche calls the poverty mentality. So generosity may not be something we can do initially, but we can look at how impoverished we feel how possessive we feel, how territorial we feel. And I think it's a, an important thing to reflect on is, and I brought this up before, we can ask ourselves, do we really want to be on the Bodhisattva path? You, you don't have to do this. It's not a requirement that there's a tremendous amount of relief that can come from just practicing the Shravakayana. So it's something to reflect on. Do we really recognize what we recite on a daily basis when we say, I vow to be with all things, when we take refuge for the benefit of others, when we dedicate the merit, dedication of merit? We all have that so memorized 
that we've forgotten what we say most of the time. And I know this is the case because when I'm asked to dedicate the merit, if I think too hard about it, I don't remember how to start it. So habituated, but that is what we do at the end of every forum. We say, may everyone, may everyone have what I've, what I've accumulated and may I keep nothing for myself. That's a radical statement and we shouldn't just make it flippantly. We should occasionally reflect on not do I mean it, like do I really mean it, but that's something we say every day. May others benefit from everything I do, and do we really want that to be the case? I don't know what the answer is, but it may help us keep some freshness in our path to actually consider the words we recite and the actions we take. And even when we find that we are unable to be generous, we can begin to recognize the generosity of the situation, the incredible generosity of every situation we find ourselves in, that everything is making itself an offering to us just by showing up in consciousness. And that's, again, something we can't just believe. It may not really resonate, but we can consider it. And I've brought this up before. It's like the meditation instruction from Sokazan's Primer, where he says this wall, just by being here, is giving you everything just to reflect and it's silly to to think about but occasionally it makes me cry like the wall being generous but that's how intimate this is just how generous everything is by presenting itself to us it doesn't mean it feels good to receive it it doesn't mean we have to see it as profound but everything's pointing out the nature of our mind Everything showing us how we're still fixated and grasping, how we're still engaged in passion, aggression, and ignorance. The wall is showing us that. One another showing us that. The teacher showing us that. The snow, which I've been bitching about all day, has been showing us that. It was in Atlanta last week. It's warm. But what makes me mad is it was warm here. <laughs> I didn't get anything special. I should have gone this week and could have laughed at everyone in the snow. Before I take questions, I just thought, again, because it's basic Buddhist teachings, um, I am trying to be a little bit more provisional or come back to some of the more foundational teachings, particularly with the Mahayana. And generosity being the first paramita is broken down into three forms. Uh, there's three forms of giving a bodhisattva practices. And the first form is the simplest form. The first form is material offerings. If somebody's hungry, you offer them food. If somebody is sick, you care for them. If they're homeless, you house them within reason can't have a homeless shelter in a monastery necessarily, but we can help. So this is the first form of generosity is just helping the basic needs of our community be met. And what's interesting is the parallels here. To me, uh, Karma House Community Wellness Center is the first form of giving. We're not talking about Buddhism too much. We are just trying to give these young people some brief glimpses of relief from their life, little tools to just make it through the day regardless of where they go. The second form of generosity is the, the gift of fearlessness. And for this, it becomes a little more complicated. We have to begin to recognize the completeness of one's being, that we are not threatened, that we are also not lacking. This perhaps takes more skillful means. This is where we may need a teacher to come in and to navigate that area. And the last form of generosity is the generosity of the Dharma, to actually uh, support someone on their path to liberation. Kui Nung said it this way, the sixth ancestor in China, he said, and you've heard this quite a few times, but if somebody's ready for the Dharma, teach them the Dharma, but if they're not, teach them to be kind. So even Hui Nung is saying, 
completely powerful and valuable and valid to just start out with recognizing a basic type of human decency. I have one more thing. I, like I said, I, I was able to spend about 40 minutes studying today, so I actually have some material. <laughs> Um, the last thing I thought that was interesting was Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche and talking about the six paramitas. Talked about, has anyone heard of the 36 paramitas? 30, the 36 paramitas. And I thought this was really beautiful. It's not actually 36 paramitas. It's actually looking at each paramita in the context of one another. So you have generosity, but then you have generosity discipline. You have generosity, patience, you have generosity, exertion, generosity, meditation, generosity, wisdom. There's six. Then you have discipline, discipline, generosity, discipline, patience. You get the idea. But to ha see how collaborative those are, and Trungpa Rinpoche even says they, they have to arise simultaneously, but they have to be studied progressively. And progressively, not necessarily meaning you have to start with generosity, and then you have to go to discipline, but the actual uh, arising of the paramitas and the bodhisattva occurs simultaneously, but we do study them individually. And so with coming up with the 36 paramitas, it gives us an opportunity to begin to investigate the interplay and the intimacy of these six paramitas. So uh, Shoka. <clears throat> Shogabai, can the 36 paramitas be worked with in a way that's not overwhelmingly conceptual? Can the 36 paramitas be worked with in such a way that is not overwhelmingly conceptual? I think that it doesn't matter. <laughs> that, as Sokazan has said, it's most important to study and that you don't need to study it in that way. We could just start with one. I think I think Dana Paramita, I think generosity is a really good starting point to investigate what does it mean for a bodhisattva to give and not give out of concepts, but give out of the situation itself. And so the initial situation may be seeing how removed we believe ourselves to be from the situation or how much power we think we can exert on the situation. So I just thought that was curious because I like the idea of I like the idea of considering what does it mean for discipline to be generous? Because discipline sometimes has a, a more cold connotation, can have an edge to it, especially around if it's enforced or if there's aggression, or to, to consider what is the generosity of meditation. We exert ourselves in meditation on a daily basis, and what is it to do so generously? Like I said, it, it may or may not resonate, but the most important thing is if it shows up, so Kazan asks for us to study it, or if you come across it, that we just consider it in the context of how it shows up, which may be feeling overwhelmed or feeling disinterested in it. Further questions, Bion? Bion Belling, is a bodhisattva more sophisticated more advanced if they are generously giving the dharma versus um, maybe helping with physical needs basic needs no because the, the whole hierarchy is fabricated so the bodhisattva's generosity is situational so the greatest generosity is the one that is apparent and in front of them so even in that progression, I think it takes, um, it does feel that it's more complicated and that there's some skillful means necessary and some insight in order to help somebody navigate the Dharma instead of just, you know, forcing it on them. But I feel that the Buddha offered generosity and it's talked about that he offered generosity by begging for food, that he gave everyone he asked for food an opportunity to give to him. When seen clearly, you could say that in that gesture of material transaction, all three forms of generosity occur. Um, so again, that division is, is artificial. It helps us investigate. It helps us look at it. 
but I feel that the activity of a bodhisattva does not function on hierarchy and that if seen clearly every situational gesture would encompass uh, would encompass the entire paramita yeah. bowing what is the is there an ultimate uh, is there a generosity that covers all three of those areas of giving you could come up with an example but it wouldn't be ultimate generosity because it would be some concept of transaction and so i think again if we look at this this is provisional it's it's a framework for us to study to contemplate to look at but not to uh, imitate or replicate i feel that the expression of a bodhisattva is spontaneous it's completely uh intimate with the situation as it arises and so in that sense you could say that every gesture of a bodhisattva would encompass those three now you could say well but what if they're not giving a thing then i guess you probably have me there mozuku mozuku bowing how do how do we understand the gift of fearlessness i i don't remember what that actually is it would be worth i would recommend to anyone um as i understand it these three volumes are you can't hear who can't I hear her question no okay you could repeat it or she could say Go ahead. Mazuku bowing, how, how do we understand the gift of fearlessness? I don't remember what it is. And I and I was just saying that it Trungpa Rinpoche, I was talking to Biyun before I started, and I feel sometimes why am I giving these talks? I should just tell you where what I read and said. This is it's said very concisely here. He says <laughs> it very um he just has a very accessible way of teaching the Dharma. Uh, the fearlessness that begins to be instilled, I feel, is when uh, the teacher starts pointing that we are not lacking, that we are not waiting for something, that that lack of being able to be threatened, that the value is uh, inherent or is the, the word birthright has come up before. And so I, I that really resonates with me. It's also frightening and disappointing as a practitioner to be told that you don't need to get anything or get anywhere or get rid of anything. As we sit with that, I think fearlessness arises as a, a form of confidence that I can do this. And why can I do this? Because I don't need to gain anything to do this. I don't need any, um, I'm not lacking something that would keep me from practicing. You have a teacher, you have the forms, you have the Dharma, you have the Sangha and you can do this. That's the refrain we hear quite often. You can do this. I had a question on a different area, and that is, I think you said there's no requirement for the Bodhisattva path, that you could just practice the Shravaka path. Yes. How would that show up in our community, or how would it work if some people were not on the Bodhisattva path or just practicing for themselves? The first thing I would say is we should look very closely at whatever standard we would use to evaluate that. We have no grounds to make that assessment of somebody else's practice. So how it would look would really be up to the, the student and the teacher. And that may be a situation where it's, it's appropriate to, to, to find a community that is more in line with maybe more a more strict ascription to the Vinaya or a more literal interpretation of the Buddha's Dharma. And I don't I, I don't know how to say that and, and emphasize I do not mean that in any disrespectful way that that is a completely valid and valuable way to practice the Buddha's Dharma. Mazuku bowing, I, I don't know much about Shravaka practice or yeah. Not other paths besides the Mahayana, but 
I think they still include practices of kindness and the four immeasurables yes. types of practices. So what would what would distinguish it, I guess? It would depend on the community. So the traditional practices, if you were to go to uh, a Theravadan temple, you may be more practicing uh, body scanning me meditation. You may be more of a mindfulness orientation, and it may be a more active practice of trying to remove defilements, relating to defilements as obstacles, purifying the mind, again, at the exclusion of negativity, and the emphasis would be on the liberation of oneself. You definitely would still be practicing generosity. The six paramitas show up in the Pali Canon. Sometimes you actually have 10 paramitas in the Mahayana. Um, which include skillful means and power and knowledge. Um, but the emphasis is still on one's own liberation. I don't know that there's a recognition of Buddhas everywhere that traditionally sometimes focus on. You can finish your sentence. I was just going to say that classically, there's only one Buddha per Kalpa that we Buddhahood is not accessible to us, that the next Buddha would be Maitreya Buddha. So there's several ways that the three elements are talked about, and the way that I'm uh, looking at here is the uh, uh, Shravakayana, which you're talking about as a Hinayana, and then there's the Pratyeka Bodhiyana, and there's um, the Bodhisattva Yana. Could you say something about the Pratyeka Bodhiyana? The Pratyeka Bodhiyana, as I understand, is sometimes defined as a self-stylized Buddha. And that's not to say that an awakening of sorts has not happened, but it oftentimes is associated with realization in isolation, that one wakes up for one's own benefit and also does so through one's own means. That's not to say they've not heard the Buddha's Dharma or they're not practicing the Buddha's Dharma, but the Shravakayana literally would be those that, that heard physically firsthand the words of the Buddha, the Pracheka Buddhayana, the Pracheka path would be the self stylized uh, awakening. And then the Bodhisattva Yana would be one who uh, lives and functions for the benefit of others. And the most classical way of saying it, and I can't defend this or, or go beyond that, but it's said that they delay their own awakening until all beings are awakened. It, I don't know. Yes. So on your uh, perception, and I realize you're, um, we're just talking about your perception here. Have you met people who you would, that you feel just on your first thought, best thought, uh, are in all three of those, or one of those, uh, Yana's a Shravaka Yana, Pateka Bodhiyana, Bodhisattva Yana? Have you met people that you feel like this one is uh, in this Yana? I don't know that I've, felt confident to delineate in that sense oh, and I, to name them. <laughs> I just I, I what I've noticed is over time I feel less and less confident in that sense and also less inspired to try to understand there are people that have had um, a strong impact on me you as my teacher and as you know these recurring dreams about Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche and I can't say that he was awakened being or not. I don't, if I were to do that, it would just be repeating something or speculating. Mm -hmm. Anything else you see in that area? What I'm working with now is, and that feels most supportive is to come back to Trungpa's encouragement to recognize a basic human decency, that it, it really does not, there is no delineation. And that my responsibility is whether a Buddha shows up in front of me or somebody who is in the hell realm uh, to recognize and endeavor to respond situationally to them as they arise. How are the dreams you're having of Dogo Kense Rinpoche? How are those uh, teaching for you? There's uh, looking at the seduction. They're in particularly early on to try to draw some conclusion. I feel less inclined towards that. They're still pretty emotional. And I come back to a phrase that you've used a lot, uh, which is appreciation. They could be 
fully just fabrications of my subconscious and my imagination, or they could be something greater. There's no way for me to tell, but I can, I can enjoy them when I'm not trying to get them to point to something. Thank you. Thank you. Unyo. Unyo Bowling, you just said it a minute ago and earlier, um, you said the six paramitas are based on human decency. Yes. What is human decency, especially in our world of war, Bowling? That you can look at somebody and you can recognize that they don't need to earn uh, your your love, your compassion, your kindness. That also does not mean you need to submit yourself to their impulses. But it looks at that sort of discrimination, that evaluation that we spontaneously have based on our projection of who we think is arising in front of us. And the stronger we believe that, the more difficult it is for any of the paramitas to arise because we are still strategizing our expressions based on our projections of the world and our projections of those that arise in front of us. It seems that especially here, uh, as we come up to a national election, that there is a great lack of human decency in some of the name calling that's going on in our political situation. So is there a way then as uh, bodhisattvas that we can find out what what the truth is in those types of uh, characterizations? Is there any truth to be found there? Bobby? Yes, and it's not going to show up as uh, being able to sift through that. The truth is not a content, it's not a concept, it's not a resolution of the conflict. The, the truth to me is the recognition of the first noble truth of suffering. And so it's just far too seductive to get pulled into the politics. And it's far too seductive to have the right side because we are informed. And it's much harder to see that there is not one character that shows up on the screen or in our day-to-day -day life that is not living out of the first noble truth. And as a bodhisattva, they are our responsibility. Junyabawin, another question. Uh, you were talking about bodhicitta, which is the energy to serve others. Is that energy something that can be manufactured? Um, it can not be manufactured, but it can be practiced. It can be practiced through having an intention. It can be practiced through not abandoning our reactions to the world. But I don't know that it can be manufactured. That being said, I feel that if somebody like yourself or anyone else continues to show up here, there's no way that that would happen if there was not some shred of bodhicitta. And what's wonderful is you don't have to recognize it. It's probably something we can't really recognize, but our persistence, whether we see it or not, can be an expression of that bodhicitta. Uh, you Dao. You Dao Bao, and uh, you were talking about the three types of generosity, and I hadn't heard the second one as fearlessness before. I heard it as protection. Is is there some way that that is they are the same or similar? Well, probably. <laughs> I don't know what that's being translated out of, but different people have clearly chosen different ways to translate it, but it's probably referencing the same source material. I don't know what that would be if that comes out of the Nikayas or later Mahayana Sutras. I would, I would imagine that they're pointing at the same thing, just different ways of talking about it. Bien? Bien Baling, can we, how can we help others if we are, if we, believe that we are above them or below them. The, the way in which we help others, it comes back to starting out with that, that initial foundational practice of meditating. We don't need to worry about producing some grand gesture of bodhisattva activity. 
but the gestures of a bodhisattva arise spontaneously through training the mind. So if we can return back to the disappointment of seeing our, our pride and our shame, you know, the, the pretension or the, the minimizing that we do to ourselves, that's also something that helps us recognize it in others. And so to come back to the beginning of the talk, my idea, my image is that looking up, that you recognize something, you recognize it in yourself in such a way you see the universality of it. So that when you do look up, when you do meet the world, that you, you don't see something separate from the very thing that you saw when you were sitting in meditation. So we return to that form. We return to that container so that we can begin to recognize that we recognize to me that first noble truth. It's difficult to see it when it's so bogged down by the stories, because the stories are what allows us to evaluate, to create hierarchies, to discriminate, and it covers up the rawness of that first noble truth. So as we return to that rawness over and over, Trungpa Rinpoche uses that very word and the image of a wound to talk about bodhicitta. So we return to the rawness of ourselves, that wound, that opening, that sensitive sore spot that we can begin to relate to others out of because it's it's not ours, it's not personal, it's not unique. You recognize it as a universal situation, a universal truth of dukkha. Well, so Kubaling, earlier you brought up that um, it's possible to consider others as a cover-up of your own suffering. Yes. So on the Mahayana path, if we're intending and endeavoring to consider others, can we recognize when that's bodhicitta and when it's covering up our own suffering? There's, to me, I don't know if this is a great word, but there's safeguards on the path. You know, when you're not a self-stylized Buddha, when you're a self-stylized Buddha, you have one interpretation, and that's your ego. Filters everything. It's not to say that I couldn't crack apart, but the safeguards on the path include the teacher, they include the form of seated meditation, they include the Sangha, they include the Dharma. So even when we do start to slide into those areas of self-deception, which we do, and we shouldn't necessarily try not to, the forms, the containers help bring us back to the intention to see, um, which offers very little reference point because we're not looking for a thing to see. We're just returning to the intention to see. Well, you just said, I think that we shouldn't necessarily intend to try not to. Yes. Um, are you saying that we should intend to consider others and put others before ourselves regardless of whether or not we could be covering up our own suffering and then we'll just see it if we cover it up i think we should continue to have the intention around the bow that's i think that's pretty straightforward we have an intention to be with others we know that in doing so there are times where we may act in a way to cover up our own suffering and that the forms and the situation that's been created in this manda will help us return back to that initial intention. It's very difficult to hang out in self-deception when we're constantly exposed to the Sangha and we're constantly exposed to the Dharma, we're constantly exposed to the Buddha, we're constantly exposed to the teacher. So you could say there is a little bit of trust or benefit of the doubt that if, if that wasn't the case, you wouldn't need to do this here. But we recognize that there is something about the mandala that is this monastery, that is this community that helps us um, return over and over again to that vow and to that intention. So, Karen. So, Karen Bowing, you connected deeply to the generosity of what was arising. Um, and you said it even made you somewhat emotional when you spoke about the generosity of maybe reaching out into the world as a bodhisattva it didn't seem as connected is there doubt there that dana given by you is not is there doubt 
really. I guess I've not I've not considered it. It it shows up quite functionally, and and not as a credential. So Kazan has asked me to do certain things, and at, it just doesn't really show up as a consideration. It's we go to Kalamazoo on Monday, we go to Grand Rapids on Tuesday. I go to the community college. I go to the high school. I go to the library, and there's there's really no dialogue about it. Um, what's nice is that I don't need to evaluate if I'm being of benefit. And if I do, then the, that sort of strategy could actually start to cover up the very people that show up in front of me. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, rel it's a fairly functional expression at this point. Thank you. Jishin, and then we'll close. Jishin um, I just would like to first clarify if I understood you correctly. Did you say that people on the Bodhisattva's uh, path delay the awakening to help others? Yes, and I qualified that by saying that that is purely a, a classical expression in Buddhism, that it is said a Bodhisattva refrains from awakening and again i don't i don't know what that means or how you would have say so over that but refrains your awakening until all sentient beings are liberated the other way of saying that is a bodhisattva vows to return to samsara until all beings are liberated so then you start to get into that idea of of reincarnation that a, a bodhisattva continues to come back and you have these lineages of tulkus in tibetan buddhism that uh Dalai Lama, the Trungpa Talku, the uh, Kensei Talku is the Karmapas continuing to come back for the benefit of others. Thank you. You, you. you actually answered already my first question, how would how this could be done? And you said you don't know. Uh, and the second question is, um, what would be the benefit if, if it seems to me from our experience with Sokozan that having a teacher who um, sees through and teaches from what he sees uh, is, is the best way, if I can use this uh, kind of qualification. So uh, just asking what, what would be the benefit of not being awakened for the teacher on the Bodhisattva path? <coughs> I don't know. It just becomes, and it's. I think it's a valid scholastic question, and it would be purely speculation for me. Um, what shows up more strongly is a few. Uh, maybe in January, we talked about the four reminders, and the first one was the precious human birth. And I just wouldn't take this birth for granted with the assumption. Well, I'll come back and finish it up next time. Um, we should. We should. If we feel inspired, if we feel connected, we should give ourselves as best as we can to the path and to our vows and to the practice, recognizing that we, we have no idea what's coming. Um, and so I, I don't rely too heavily on that idea of, well, I'll get it next time or um, I'll just keep coming around. Uh, this is the birth we know we have right now. Even that's a bit shaky. We don't know when it will end. We've been given an opportunity with these teachings we felt inspired by the Bodhisattva path. And so we should do our, our best to extend ourselves to the world by training our minds and, uh, and being kind. Thank you. Thank you. We'll stand and dedicate the merit.